God has always been deeply interested in the health and well-being of his people. You can go back in the Bible all the way to the Garden of Eden. God didn't start Adam and Eve off with the pizza. He started them off with apples and things like that. Exodus 15, uh, the last part of 25 and 26, we just read it. And he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So all the way back, the Egyptians had some diseases, and we think we know what some of those are, and they're basically a lot of the ones we see today in our world. If you go up to the New Testament, what do you have? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, what kind of a sacrifice? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I have a book here called The Ministry of Healing. It was published in 1905. Ellen G. White's the author. So this goes way back or at the beginning of our church, really. We actually had an emphasis on health. Different churches, some have some emphasis on the health question, but not most, mostly it's very general. Uh, the Mormons actually had talk a little bit about health. But I think that of all the churches that have an em em emphasis on health, Seventh-day Adventists, we are the, we are the, for better or worse, we're the leaders of it. And I'm going to read to you from page 127 something. Well, actually, let me start on the first page, the first page of the main text. When she starts the book, she says this, Our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world as the unwearied servant of man's necessity. He took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses that he might minister to every need of humanity. She's quoting Matthew 8, 17. And then she said, the burden of disease and wretchedness and sin he came to remove. Didn't come to mitigate it. He came to remove disease. His mission is to bring them in complete restoration. And if that's his mission, maybe I'm just too simple, but I think if that's Jesus' mission, that's our mission too. So when you become, when you and I became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you know what? You were automatically issued eight doctors. Eight doctors. You get eight doctors the day, the day you're baptized. You get eight of them. And we, we have them listed here. Now you've heard of the, almost everybody's heard of New Start, right? New Start's an acronym, nutrition, exercise, water, temperance, Rest, air, what was S? Sunshine, and then trust in divine power. But it really comes from this page 127, and I'm going to read it to you from that. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power, these are the True remedies, every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. And then she says, unfortunately, the use of natural remedies requires an amount of care and effort that many are not willing to give. So, you might have noticed the last two years or so, there's different uh, disease things happening. You just might have noticed. And I wonder if we're living in an era, a crazy era of disease, I wonder if God gave these things maybe ahead of time to help us be wise and ready and better prepared. Because whatever you decide about vaccination or masks or, or whatever the different things to do or not do about this, if your general health is good, isn't that going to make your doctor smile? Isn't that going to make you smile? 
Aren't you going to be better prepared? If we're living in an era of end-time bioweapons being released, isn't it better to be healthy? So what I'm going to talk to you about today is these eight items. I'm going to call them the eight doctors. These are a gift to us, I believe, from Jesus to help his people be ready. I don't think we've put these eight doctors in the front these last two years. I think we've gone along with every which thing that's come off the television to us as a general thing, and I, I think we've, we've not met our Lord's purpose. And then the last part of the talk today, maybe the last 20%, I'm going to talk about the ninth doctor. Eight doctors are nine. Okay? Okay. There's eight doctors that we're going to talk about that are uh, good doctors. And you might get a hint here that I, I'm concerned about doctor number nine. So we're going to talk a little bit about doctor number nine. And I'm going to share with you after. Didn't do this right away. Didn't do it after a year. Didn't do it after a year and a half. But just, just briefly, I want to share with you my present working understanding of what we're living in. So I didn't jump up to do it. But I think when we talk about the ninth doctor, we need to... We need to get some, uh, we need to think about that. So I believe God has given us some help. He's wanting us to be prepared for the things coming on this world, and therefore he's helped us with these eight doctors. If you look at Matthew 24, verse 7, I'm going to invite you to turn to Matthew 24, verse 7. I want to look at one thing that Jesus said also. Of course, you know that Matthew 24 uh, is all about these end-time events that we anticipate to happen. And we kind of put the end-time way off in the future somewhere. Uh, you know, maybe my grandkids, that'll, they'll, they'll get the real deal, and we just get to kind of coast. Uh, when we're done here, you'll, you'll understand. I don't believe we're coasting that far out. I think we're, we're surfing uh, pretty close to the edges. In Matthew 24, verse 7, there's something that Jesus said that should make us sit up and take notice. I mean, if Jesus says it, shouldn't we be careful? Among the many things said there, verse 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. In the book Great Controversy, you might have read another statement from Ellen White. Again, I'm not here to really push on Ellen White, but I, we believe God revealed through her a special insight for us in these times, kind of in a prophetic mode, a prophetic way. And so we're interested in the things she has to say. And in the book Great Controversy, which we have out here, you can take one with, home with you today if you don't have one. On page 589 and thereabouts, there's two things she says. Through spiritualism, she's talking about the end times. Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a benefactor of the race. Healing the diseases of the people and professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith. But at the same time, he works as a destroyer. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin. Intemperance dethrones reason. Sensual indulgence, strife, and bloodshed follow. And then she goes on and says this. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies... He will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Now, to my knowledge, none of the populous cities on this planet, I would say so far, have been reduced, totally reduced, to ruin and desolation. So I believe that's talking about something she saw in the future. How far in the future? Well, I'm not sure of that. So there's nine doctors at work. Eight are given by the creator, and they fit kind of a creation profile. We'll talk about those just in one moment. And there's one who's fitting, I would say, a destruction profile. He's offering fake healing. And we're going to look at Revelation, at Revelation chapter 18 before we're done today. Could it be that God, foreseeing the intemperance, the self-indulgence, and the diseases, even of human design in these last days armed us, armed us with eight doctors to especially help us survive. Could it be? So let's go through the eight doctors. 
first I want to start with the doctor called Pure Air. Pure Air. God armed us with these eight doctors. If we heed the counsel of these eight doctors, I think we'll be well positioned to pass through the pestilence that's been unleashed to us today. All right, pure air. Spending some time outdoors will introduce pure air into our lungs. Did you know that inside an automobile, inside a home, or a building of any kind, there are toxins and unhealthful fumes that are released? They become trapped and they build up, and we sometimes are spending a lot of our time inside. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've spent a lot of our time inside, haven't we? In fact, we've been told, you know, stay inside, don't go anywhere. Well, indoor pollution can include all kinds of biologicals like pet dander. Do any of you have pets in your homes? It can include mold and mildew. It can include house dust mites. Formaldehyde is a cancer-causing chemical used in composite wood products. There's probably not a home built today that doesn't use composite wood. And then there's VOCs, V-O-Cs, volatile organic compounds. They're found in paints and varnishes. Any of you have anything painted or varnished in your home? All of us. Some of those are dangerous. And there's a long list of things that uh, I'm just touching the surface here. Suffice it to say, it's good to open your windows a crack and spend some time outdoors. Almost none of these kinds of issues were widely understood at the time when, when Ellen White wrote this book. And yet we have counsel to get pure air, make sure that we're breathing pure air. And so this has implications for anything that would inhibit our breathing, pure air. So anyway, pure air is one of the doctors. Let's go to Dr. Sunlight. Next on the list, uh, do you remember a guy named Dr. Kellogg? You've all heard of Kellogg's cornflakes. You know that early in the Adventist church there was a man named Kellogg. He was related to the cornflake guy. They all connected to the cornflakes. Sunlight, Dr. Sunlight. We know that if you get too much sunlight at the wrong time, it can burn you, right? It can give you issues and give you skin cancer, melanoma if you get burned. But Dr. Kellogg, did you ever see a picture of him wearing anything but white clothing? No, because he believed that sunlight was very important. And by wearing white clothing, you're allowing the maximum amount of light to, to pass through. Dark clothing, like many of us are wearing today, Light doesn't pass through it as well. So maybe he was on to something there. Sunlight, the right exposure of it can help our bodies form the hormone vitamin D. It's called a vitamin, but it's actually a hormone. It, when the sunlight hits your skin, if you have enough sunlight, it can help form vitamin D. Receiving an appropriate amount of vitamin D could be one important step to help prevent ourselves from becoming infected with COVID-19. Maybe you've actually heard this is one of the few things that's actually been talked about besides the vaccination idea is they say you should take a lot of vitamin D and you, need, you may need to supplement vitamin D. A German study suggests that 41% of respiratory disease mortality is statistically attributable to deficiency in vitamin D. 41%, that's a pretty high percentage. Of course, you know what SARS-CoV-2 is, right? Severe acute respiratory, uh, what, syndrome, uh, coronavirus. So this is a, a, a coronavirus deals with your respiratory system. And so get your vitamin D. Some people need more vitamin D than others. People who live in northern climates, you better double check and make sure you're getting enough vitamin D. People with darker skin need more vitamin D. Also, people who are heavier than they should be and people who are older than they should be. Older than they should be. That's not written here, but uh, anyway, people that are older. <laughs> Sunlight also provides ultraviolet light, and experiments have shown that COVID-19, have you ever heard of sunlight as a disinfectant? Experiments have shown that they were really surprised when they put COVID-19 up against sunlight. They said it disappeared uh, two or three times faster than they expected it would in 10 to 20 minutes in some studies. So if you want to make sure there's no COVID-19 lurking on your kitchen table, open your window shades and, and uh, nuke it with ultraviolet light from the sun. So uh, most of us get very little vitamin D in our diets, so su supplementation is good, being outdoors is good. This time of year, you won't get much vitamin D from being outdoors, but um, one thing I've done since the beginning of this is careful 
rigorous supplementation. And praise the Lord, it's keeping, it's helped keep, I think, healthy. Let's go down to the next doctor, Dr. Abstemiousness. That's an old retired word, we don't use it anymore. It's replaced by another word, temperance, which we don't use anymore. There's, <laughs> these words just don't get used anymore, do they? Really what it means, though, if you look it up, is to be exercising self-control. And this is an option available to all of us. Every single person can be a little bit more self-controlled, and it may help us to resist uh, the challenges of COVID-19 and other kinds of disease. So the plan is to make sure that you don't overeat. Abstemiousness, though, actually goes a little bit further. They say it, it means being sparing in eating and drinking. So next time you're thinking about, man, that was good. One more helping won't hurt. You may want to de uh, decrease your helpings the helpings of the things you eat, because God designed the body. He said the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and a lot of us are bringing a lot of things into the temple that kind of like too much. And um, the less food you process, the less there is to digest, to slow down or ferment in your gut or to um, slow you down in different ways. The Bible warns us against eating. I started to make a list of Proverbs to share with you about touching over eating, but the list became so long I decided I'll just say, go to the Proverbs. There's a lot of them there, things that talk about don't overeat. Modern industrial food science often works directly against the plan to be abstemious. Many dollars have gone into gaining a better understanding of how fat, sugar, salt, and chemicals can combine to give food the most attractive textures and flavors. Thankfully, yes, part of the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of self-control. But that um, some of us are not practicing abstemiousness too well. We have our favorite foods, and we overeat them. Do not ignore the third of the eight doctors, Dr. Abstemiousness. He can improve your health dramatically. I mean, really, if we're living in an era when possibly a bioweapon has been set loose on planet Earth, I'll talk about that at the end. I believe that's what's happened. You can write me off right there, I guess. Um, if that's the case, being more helpful probably makes good sense. Dr. Rest is the fourth doctor. We Seventh-day Adventists should be experts at following the fourth doctor. It's a part of our religious faith, after all, to set aside a whole day for rest. The seventh day of the week. We don't chop wood on Sabbath. We don't go on shopping sprees on Sabbath. We slow down. And you know, the body needs time to restore itself. It needs rest. Every night, your, even your brain, they say, is emptying junk, physical junk, going through the system to get rid of it. And if you don't get enough sleep, somewhere, somewhere I was reading about how um, not getting enough sleep is kind of like smoking like so many cigarettes each day. So maybe you're not smoking a cigarette at all, but if you're getting some tiny amount of sleep, it might be like you just smoked 15 or 20 cigarettes that night. Not gonna be good. This doctor is one of the most ignored of all the doctors, Dr. Rest, we just keep on going, we don't stop. We all have artificial lighting in our homes. Many of us have electronic devices which emit blue light. Well, here's the deal. Your body, at the end of the day, your body begins making hormones that tell it it's time to go to sleep. But if you are soaking in all this blue light off of a TV screen, off a computer screen, off of your cell phone screen, what do you have? Your body, that, that causes this hormone not to develop, not to form. And so your body is saying to your body, oh, it's not time to go to bed yet. Don't form the sleep chemicals. And so you're, you're doing yourself harm. I've been wanting to talk about rest for a long time, but I've struggled with my own sleep, and I didn't feel like I could say anything to you about it since my sleep wasn't in order. I've increased the amount of time I'm sleeping, probably uh, an hour and a half uh, or even more. So I'm, I'm not at eight hours yet, but I'm, how much would you think it is, dear? Is it around seven? Six, six forty-five to seven, something like that. So you can see I started way, way low. But how did you do it? Well, don't eat late. Don't look at screens late. Go to bed early. Those are some of the things. Actually, I, so I put on my sleep, my sleep protector, whatever it is called, 
and that helps keep the light from coming in if the light's still on. So your eyes are your main light detecting sensors. Few people get the amount of sleep they should get. So I just suggest you work on that because your immune system needs you to get more sleep. So uh, I'm doing better, I'm not there yet, but I'm better enough that I, I feel like I can actually talk about it without, without being hypocritical. Let's go to doctor exercise. Exercise is really important. God didn't give us wheels, he gave us legs. We gave us wheels, he gave us legs. Even if some of us are mobility limited for various reasons, hopefully we can engage in, engage in at least some walking each day. Keeps you from resting, right? Uh, it's been my practice for most of my life to take an extended walk every day, almost every day, in, my, in the morning. If you have a treadmill, that's another option if it's really cold. And of course, there's many kinds of exercise, biking, swimming, and calisthenics, and so on. Those are all important. Figure out what works for you. And uh, you should do something for exercise. This is one of the eight doctors. These doctors never, they don't make a penny off of you. They don't, they never tell you anything wrong. These are principles. These are lifestyle principles that you can trust and uh, they are truthful. Some people are worried about cold weather. Don't worry about it. Just make sure you're dressed warmly. Go for a walk. When I walk, I always walk uh, along the facing oncoming traffic on that side of the road. Unless it's like really snowy, I may go across to the opposite side because I think that might be safer. Um, go for a walk with a friend. Even if it's a short walk, you might feel safer if you're walking with somebody. Take a walk. If you go uh, for a walk in the woods during the hunting season, wear something bright and do not act like a deer. So, uh, Jesus and his disciples, by the way, did what? You read the Gospels. Everywhere they went, they walked. I mean, if Jesus is our example, he was the ultimate walker. I wonder, you know, if Jesus had one of those little gadgets on his arm, like how many steps... We, we might get shamed, some of us who are finding how many steps we're trying to do a day. Jesus, I think, had a lot of steps. By the way, you can also meet neighbors when you walk. You'll find other people who are walking, too, for health reasons. And you know what? Take some glow tracks with you. Strike up a conversation. You may find they have some of the very same concerns that you do. Hand them a glow tract. Pray with them. Encourage them. Make a friend. Now, in our, our street, the ladies that walk down the street carry firearms. Yeah, anyway, there's a story that goes with that. But, um, but anyway, so far I haven't heard any shots fired, right, from that. So uh, don't let that stop you. Anyway, do some exercise, even if it's, even if it's, it's hard. Let's carry on. Doctor, uh, proper diet. And this is a scary one because a lot of us, this is a place where we need to uh, reform a lot of us don't have a proper diet. Eat more healthful foods, less highly processed foods. Adding vitamin supplements, a very good idea today. And again, we've heard uh, for COVID-19, vitamin D and what? Tell me the other one. Zinc. Vitamin D and zinc, and there's a few others that have been mentioned. Okay, so you probably want to supplement. If you're not eating a, a meat, any meat in your diet, you want some vitamin B12. Most of us, they say, are vitamin B12 deficient. Now, there's differences between natural fats like avocado and processed fats, differences between highly processed sugars and more natural sugars. Some of you that might not uh, healthfully be able to eat some of the fats, the, the more processed ones, you could do something maybe like avocado. So anyway, there's different ways to get flavor. You beware of sweets and candies. They'll nuke your immune system. And if there's any time when you don't want your immune system nuked, I'd say it's right now. This is a real thing. Some people have wondered, is, this, is COVID a real thing? Some of us might have even wondered at different times. But I believe it's a real thing. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want to play with it. It's serious. The devil works on us by trying to get us to eat too much. We have foods we especially like, and we can generate an enormous dopamine hit in the brain. You know what they did? They, they made a gadget. They put it on, on people's head, and they... Uh, they could tell, like, the things that, when they put them on cocaine, they saw which parts of the brain light up the most, the reward system. 
And they said, oh, okay, and they took note of that. Then they wanted to take people and find out about eating. Does eating light up the brain? And they found out they had problems because when people chew, it, 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 your whole head moves. So they did something, they, they started, to, what they did, they take the food, they, they put it in the microwave, they brought it in so you could smell it. And then they took the food and they rubbed a cotton swab on it and they came and they put it on the tongue. And then they did the reading and guess what they found out? The very same parts of the brain that light up for cocaine light up for your favorite food. So... Uh, you have 10,000 taste buds in your mouth, five main sensations, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and one that's kind of like savory. Your nose has millions of receptors, and you can differentiate between 340 and 380 basic smells and thousands of other smells besides that are more particular. So you want to control these things rather than letting them control you. So be careful about having a proper diet. It's not going to happen unless you make it happen. The next we have is Dr. Water. We just say water, drink eight glasses of water a day and you're done. No, water can be used in a lot of ways that are very healthy. Your body's always releasing water all the time. So water is used in so many different ways. It's necessary for the health of your cells. It's, you, you want uh, for bathing, it's necessary. For digestion, it's necessary. Your brain is mostly water. Your body is mostly water. You want some, some water. You can use hot and cold water to modify your circulation. And remember what I read where she said, a lot of people aren't willing to do what it takes, basically, to, to be healthful. And you and I might even admit it. I'm really not excited about sitting up and doing the, with the fom fomentations and hot and cold, especially the cold. I don't like the cold. But you know what? These are things that can help us. Your body needs it. So not only drink it, headaches, they say, can be caused even by a very mild dehydration. You ever had a headache? You might have needed more water. The cells that make up your body, they all need water to work efficiently. If you don't work efficiently, guess what? The virus has come along and they say, oh, oh this person has uh, got the right, the right problems for us. And the virus gets happy. I don't like happy virus, do you? Finally, we have doctor, the eighth doctor, trust in divine power. Trust in divine power. Now, all these other doctors, they work for everybody, right? If you're a heathen, if, you, if, you, if you're an atheist, or if you're a, a Christian person, whoever you are, uh, you can use, use all those principles. But this eighth principle, trust in divine power, it's not going to work for somebody who's not willing to trust in divine power. So these are all gifts that God has given us. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to be healthy. He didn't make your body to be disastrous. He made your body to be awesome. And so he's given us these doctors. Trust. Many choose not to trust in divine power. Instead, what do they do? They trust in human power. Well, they trust in human expertise, human theories and assertions. But trust in God is very important. We all bear mo If we bear our own anxieties, guess what? You're going to be a sad person. But if we trust in God, if at the end of the day we say, you know what, God is good, God loves me, I can give my problems to Jesus, I can trust him, and he can take care of that, I'm going to sleep. That's good for you. That's a good thing for you. We don't need to carry that enormous psychological weight. We can trust in Jesus. When we've done all that we can about something, we can trust and then we can just let God have the rest and let the burden fall off of our tiny human shoulders onto his massive, divine, infinite shoulders, and he'll take care of us. Remember, God designed us as dependent beings, not independent beings. We are finite. We are limited. The God of heaven is infinite. He's all-powerful. And so, guess what? It's actually very logical to trust in God. It's very logical to say, Jesus... Jesus, I just give this to you. Worrying has never been known to be a very effective therapy. Did anybody ever worry and uh, write a book? Can you go down to Barnes & Noble and read a book that says uh, uh, how to worry yourself to better health? There's, there's no book like that. So these eight doctors have one feature in common that makes them unattractive to many people. They are nature's remedies. God, God made nature. They're natural, they harmonize with the human experience, and they really don't cost very much. 
These are lifestyle doctors, okay? There's a great deal of choice involved in how we relate to these doctors. These are not pills that you can manufacture and make a lot of money selling, so they're not very popular with pharmaceutical mega corporations. Have you ever heard of remdesivir? It's a fairly new uh, medicine, at least we call it a medicine. It costs about 10 bucks to make a dose. They sell it for $3,000 to $5,000 a dose. They use it for COVID-19. The doctors, the nurses in some of the hospitals actually renamed it. Instead of remdesivir, they called it run. Death is near. It's kind of sad. Now, if you've taken remdesivir and you survive, good for you. Anyway, well, we're not here to talk about that. God designed the immune system, and he basically gave one to everybody. Now, some people have a compromised immune system. That's true. But if you treat your body with respect as God's property, as the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is what the New Testament says it is, that has incalculable health benefits. We're still situated in a world of sin, and we're still subject to deterioration and disease because of that. You can live by these health principles and still get a terrible disease. We can trust the Lord, though. The thing is, we can do a lot to help ourselves not only be holy and happy, but healthy. God desires us to be healthy. That's God's will for us. He says that we, for us to be living sacrifices. Adventists have been teaching healthful living since our beginnings. Almost the first thing God gave this early, the early Seventh-day Adventist church was the health message. So that's why I say when you become an Adventist, you are checked out. You immediately get eight doctors. And these aren't even limited to us. Anybody, anybody who wants to follow these eight doctors can follow them. So we've not suddenly become health fanatics because there's some kind of a disease thing going on because of COVID. Among Christians, we have a very strong interest in health, and we've had it since the beginning, before, long before the beginning of this current situation. Well, I mentioned a ninth doctor. The title of the message is Eight Doctors or Nine. So these first eight are from Jesus. I think it's a gift to us. I do believe that there is another doctor, however, who is vying for our attention. Let's go over to the book of Revelation. Let's go back to chapter 18 or so in the book of Revelation. Chapter 18 of Revelation describes at last the judgment and destruction of Babylon. I'm going to go ahead and call this guy, this ninth doctor, Dr. Pharma. Okay, Dr. Pharma. It comes from a word in Revelation 18, verse 23. If you read Revelation 18, 23, it says, the light of a lamp, this is talking about the judgment of Babylon, and I'll just read it. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you, you Babylon, anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery, pharmakia, is the word underneath that, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. What is Babylon the Great? Some think of Babylon as strictly describing the doctrinal errors of Roman Catholicism and some, uh, some Protestant churches. Some think that's what Babylon is. But I want to suggest to you that if you study Revelation 18, you're going to find that there is actually a complex combination of three things. Merchants, governments, and religion. Merchants, governments, and religion. They all work together. They're literally described, forgive me, but the Bible describes them as literally being in bed together. And they profit together, and they're also described as being sorrowful together when final destruction comes. Now we know that Revelation 13, right? We know what's going to happen in the end of time. There's a uniting of these agencies so that no person can buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast, the name, or the number of his name, right? Okay, we all know that. That's just basic Bible. In other words, the combination of merchants, governments, and religion affects what is allowed to enter our human bodies. Revelation 18, 13 
which you might still have open in front of you, is part of this passage in Revelation 18. Did you notice what it says? It's part of a passage that is describing all these riches that suddenly we can't do anymore. We, we, can't, we can't sell the pearls and the, the great rich things and all these, and there's a long list there. And then it says in verse 13, speaking of these riches that can't be bought or sold anymore because Babylon is finally judged, very interestingly, it includes in the list, in verse 13, the bodies and souls of men. Well, that sounds like at the end of time there's some kind of a, a, re, a, 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 a rising of, of the slavery kind of thing again, doesn't it? The bodies, buying and selling, the bodies and souls of men. But that's what the Bible says. Speaking of all the riches that can no longer be bought or sold, the bodies and souls of men. Then you come to verse 23. There's some kind of bondage or slavery happening here at the end of time. Finally, we come to verse 23. I read it to you, right? Your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery, your pharmakia, we get the modern word pharmacology, pharmaceuticals. That's from this word. It comes from this Greek word. So we find this same word in other in related words in places like Revelation 9.21, Revelation 22.15, pharmakia. Usually it's in a list. It says sorcery. It's, there's a list of, of people who aren't getting into heaven or something. You can read those lists. It's the same word. Go over to Galatians 5.20. You find sorcery. It's listed there among the works of the flesh. What were they? Uh, pharmakuo is the Greek word that also goes with this. It means literally to administer drugs. Now, I'm not sure exactly what drugs they were administering 2,000 years ago. It certainly would be different from what you have today, by a long ways, I think. We can't know, we shouldn't read everything about the modern practice of medicine into the ancient practice of sorcery. We should not do that. We know there's a wide variety of occultic practices that peoples of pagan nations practiced. We know here from the text itself, we know something that's very clear. And what is that? All the nations are deceived by mystic Babylon sorcery. That's what we know. The details of it, you don't know and I don't know. And the scholars don't seem to have a lot to say about it. We know there are false miracles performed. We know that the merchants and the governments of the earth are under the effective religious control of Babylon. We know that. We also know that medicine has many remarkable benefits, as well as the corrupt and evil things that happen sometimes. Like almost everything in our world, modern medicine is a mixed bag. Many of us owe a lot of our health that we have to our personal physicians and to other medical doctors. So don't go walk away and say, oh, the pastor's against modern medicine. That's not what I'm saying. Many good and godly men and women go into medicine to do good. They go into medicine with good intentions, and they do a lot of good. And if you think that becoming a physician, because I know them, I know several physicians, if you think it doesn't cost you a lot to become a physician, you don't know what you're talking about. I go to visit a physician, and what? The phone rings, the phone rings, the phone rings. Oh, excuse me, Pastor, I'll be back in a moment. And you know what? They're constantly fielding questions, dealing with things. They don't get very much sleep sometimes. Their families don't see dad at home sometimes, or mom, because he's at the hospital. Marriages suffer. People pay a high price to be a physician to try to do good with their life. My hat is off to the doctors and people, health, health practitioners in the various ways. Be thankful and pray for your doctor. Be thankful and pray for the doctors in this church. The life of a, phys of a physician is a very busy one, and there are enormous sacrifices that are made to be able to practice medicine. But... So here comes the but. But it's important to notice a few things, not so much maybe about GPs, you know, your general practice physician, but about some of the things that are involved with today with government and medicine. So this is a book recommended by, uh, by Peter McCullough. He's a cardiologist. This is by Peter Bregan and his uh, and Ginger Ross Bregan. Bregan is an MD, and uh, there he is. 
He's talking about gain-of-function research. Have you ever heard of that? It's Goff research, G-O-F, gain-of-function. Peter Bregan writes this. What is it? Quote, gain-of-function is a misleading euphemism for taking viruses out of nature and making them more infectious or virulent, commonly turning harmless viruses into deadly human pathogens capable of causing pandemics. The term should be golf, gain-of-lethal function. That's, I didn't bring it in. That's page six of his book. If you go to, um, now here's another thing to understand. This is page 42 of his book. No SARS cove has ever been found in nature. Furthermore, no SARS cove epidemic or other emergence of SARS cove among humans has ever been traced to nature, but at least seven have been traced to labs, including SARS COVID-2, which is the, the one we're dealing with. That's page 42. You know what, what you just heard? This means that COVID-19 was man-made. It was man-made. It does not occur in nature. There are some SARS-like viruses, but they're telling us that they've never found one like this in nature. So COVID-19 was man-made. It did not arise naturally in nature. They had to go into the cave and get bat feces and do, do a pharma, do an interesting dance with it to make it dangerous. COVID-19 is a bioweapon. Sorry. It's a bioweapon released either by accident or on purpose. Now, I don't know. You don't know. You're living on a planet that's having a global health crisis because some people got into this and have released, a bioweapon's been released. Welcome to the future. Well, let's talk a little bit about vaccines and only a little bit. I'm only just gonna touch one thing. You know what, I'm, it's not working here. Here we go. Let's go on to the next one. This man, he might look familiar to you because um, he's related to one of our presidents, President Kennedy. This is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And he wrote a book that's just come out. I think it's a top, uh, the number one seller right now. Bill Gates, Big Pharma and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., New York Times bestseller. And I've got his book and I've been reading it. So just to give you one thing, I'm only gonna talk about this in passing. One example about vaccines. By the way, I'm, I'm not here, I'm not telling you to be vaccinated or not vaccinated, I'm not going there. I'm just gonna tell you one thing, that one data point in the book, and we'll move on. There's the problem of relative risk versus absolute risk. So we're gonna skip everything and go to, uh, we're just gonna talk about the numbers. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. draws data directly from Pfizer's trial for the Pfizer vaccine. So just skipping to the numbers, here it is. Statistically, 22,000 persons must be vaccinated in order to save a single life from COVID. 22,000, so the ratio is one slash 22,000. If 20, for every 22,000 people that are vaccinated, we're happy at least one person would be saved from COVID. That's the statistics they have. That's good news. One in 22,000. There's another piece of data here from the same trial. Pfizer's data also shows that in its vaccine trial, there were five excess fatal cardiac arrest cases in vaccinated individuals. So the rate there is five in 22,000. Do you understand that? For every life the vaccine saved in the trial, Five lives were lost from cardiac arrest. This is what's called all-cause mortality. And then if you look, at it goes on and says, by the way, they found hidden in the report there were five more deaths. So anyway, I'm just saying that's a piece of data we have from that vaccine. Now let's go on to the, the next piece here and pretty much almost the last year, we're almost done. Kennedy lists several officially held tabletop pandemic exercises that were conducted in the years leading up to our current COVID-19 pandemic. Most of these involved numerous participants, sometimes in multiple cities, 
along with pharmaceutical government and military officials, and they sit around a table like this one you're seeing here, and they may, may be a period of days or may all be born, one, done in one day. Sometimes they use people in 100 cities. And these are the decision makers. One person plays the president, and one plays general this and general that, and, and they all decide what to do, just, just like they're wargaming, as if a pandemic broke out. What are we going to do? Well, we'll do this, we'll do that, and so on. This is what they do. Most of these involve numerous participants. Several participants have connections with the CIA. They're all in the book here. This is a list of these things that have been happening. Now, you might have heard of one or two of these, and this isn't even a complete list, but Dark Winter 2001, that was one of these kind of exp uh, uh, trial balloons where they kind of did this to see how it worked. Then they had Atlantic Storm 2003, Global Mercury 2003, Atlantic Storm 2005, Lockstep Simulation 2010, uh, MARS 2017, uh, SPARS 2017, um, uh, I misspelled it there, um, Clade X in 2018, and then you had Crimson Contagion in 2019, and Event 2001, I'm sorry, that should say Event 201, and that was in 2019, just months before our current a pandemic thing. Each of these simulated a deadly pandemic and government responses. Now, just to take one of them, Kennedy describes event 201. 201 was the last one they did, six or eight weeks before the COVID outbreak. Here's his description. At Gates' direction, the participants, because Bill Gates funded a lot of this, you know, he's big with the vaccines and all that. Bill, at Gates' direction, the participants role-played members of a pandemic control council, wargaming a contagion that serves as a pretext for this insurgency against American democracy. They drilled a retinue of psychological warfare techniques for controlling official narratives, silencing dissent, forcibly masking large populations, and leveraging the pandemic to promote mandatory mass vaccinations. Needless to say, there was little talk of building or fortifying immune systems, existing off-the-shelf remedies or off-patent therapeutic drugs and vitamins. Instead, there was abundant talk about expanding government's authoritarian powers, imposing draconian restrictions, curtailing traditional civil rights, including rights of assembly, free speech, private property, jury trials, due process, and religious worship, as well as promoting and coercing the uptake of new patentable antiviral drugs and vaccines. The participants walked through imaginary global coronavirus contagion scenarios that focused on fear, blanket censorship, mass propaganda, and police state strategies culminating in a compulsory mass vaccination. That's page 425 of the, of the book. But anyway, I'm going to give you just two more quotes and we'll be done here. Now, remember what we talked, we had um, Crimson Contagion. Right near the bottom there, Crimson Contagion 2019. Ref with reference to Crimson Contagion, Kennedy writes this. The New York Times takeaway, because the New York Times commented on Crimson Contagion 2019. Now, Kennedy's telling what he says, what he thinks. The New York Times takeaway missed altogether the larger and more significant stories that the Crimson Contagion's planners precisely predicted every element of the COVID-19 pandemic from the shortage of masks to specific death numbers, months before COVID-19 was ever identified as a threat, and their overarching countermeasure was the pre-planned, and now he's telling his opinion, his pre the pre-planned demolition of the American Constitution by a scrupulous, scrupulously choreographed palace coup. Quote, these are brainwashing exercises, says former CIA officer and whistleblower Kevin Shipp, Getting all of these thousands of public health and law enforcement officials to participate in blowing up the U.S. Bill of Rights in these exercises, you basically have obtained their prior sign-off on torpedoing the Constitution to overthrow its democracy. They know that none of these participants are going to suddenly start soul-searching when the real thing happens. Because guess what? You're a police officer. You're a, you're a nurse. Whatever you are, you've already been kind of gone through and practiced this stuff and you were told to do it this way and this way and this way 
So when you really have a, a pandemic, what do you do? You just, you follow your training, right? That's page 425 and 424. And finally, there's this guy. That's uh, Klaus Schwab. He wrote this book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. Now, there were people saying all this talk about The Great Reset, that's just a bunch of conspiracy, conspiracy theory. Well, this guy, this is the World Economic Forum. You've heard of the UN, maybe you don't like the UN. The United Nations, it's a combination of nations. They get together and plan this and that, and they run the World Health Organization and so on. The WEF is different. The WEF is the nations plus industry, the World Economic Forum. And uh, Klaus Schwab here in his James Bond uh, villain suit there, he wrote this. On page 243 and 244, with the, this comes out, by the way, in, uh, we had, what, March 2020 was the beginning. This was printed and released in June 2020. Uh, is it June 2020 or 2021? June 2020. So here's what he says. Without delay, we need to set in motion the Great Reset. This is not a nice to have, but an absolute necessity. It is incumbent upon us to take the bull by the horns. The pandemic gives us this chance. It presents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. So how would we conclude? So I gave you scripture. I talked about the doctors. That's all inspired. I think that's all true. This part, I'm telling you, my best current working understanding. Some people say, well, the church doesn't know anything about what's going on. And a lot of things we don't know. But we do have to have a working model. You know, why are these crazy things happening in our world? And I didn't jump out and do this the first six months or the first year or the first year and a half, but almost two years in now, I'm, I'm telling you what I think. Take it or leave it. You might want to leave it. But, um, so I'm not presenting this as being the gospel. I'm just telling you this is my understanding, trying to understand it from a Bible perspective with all my human fallibility. But here's my conclusions about where we are so that we can think about where we might be going next. God foresaw everything that has happened to us these past years, these past two years. To me, that's a given. Long ago, he gave his church a special privilege by helping us understand how to employ eight natural doctors so that we could be healthy no matter what crazy thing happens. I believe that today, a ninth doctor wants us to change what we're doing. His solution works out to be to exchange our most essential liberties and force upon us endless booster shots. I'm not trying to comment about the shots, but the idea of getting IDs, past COVID passport, health passport, so the government always knows where I am, what I'm reading, and telling me where I can go and where I, where I can't go, that idea bothers me, and I think it would bother almost every American person. I believe that the current COVID-19 thing, although they've been, gone out of their way to tell us this is just a natural thing that happened, there's never been anything like that in nature reveal, released. I believe this was something that got stirred up, it was studied. President Obama, by the way, tried to end gain-of-function research and they did it anyway underneath his nose. Trump wasn't for it and they did it anyway underneath his nose. I'm not sure what the current president's view is. But anyway, this has happened, and this, was, uh, this is a bioweapon. Some of you have experienced it. And I believe that it's been released, whether intentionally or unintentionally. There's a real disease loose in the world. And many people are having their health impacted, and many have died. And more will die because this bioweapon has been released. But you should be aware that highly credible voices like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and others 
have given us important information about the origin and goals behind this crisis. Do you remember what it said there at the end of that crisis? It culminated in compulsory mass vaccination. You know that today in Austria and in Germany, they have said that completely healthy people who choose not to be vaccinated are restricted. Their liberties are restricted today. I guess I would say this, we are called to follow Jesus in a time when we are learning that authorities we have long trusted have not earned our trust. In contrast, Jesus has earned our trust. I believe that what is happening right now is something that's never happened on planet Earth. You can go back to Rome, America at the height of superpower, Cold War. You can, there's nothing anywhere that's ever happened quite like this. We are in the middle, of, in effect, of an attempted coup on a global scale. It's never, nothing like this has ever happened in human history. Jesus has given you eight doctors for this very hour. If they've released this one unintentionally, then maybe there won't be another one. But boy, that, this guy sounded kind of desperate, didn't he? This is our only chance. We've got to release, we've got to reset now. We gotta change the world now. Kloss, I don't, don't know that he was. He's more of a humanist. Fauci trained in a Jesuit university, but he says he's a humanist, so I don't know. Anyway, finish, finish here. Uh, God has given us help. He's given us eight doctors there for this hour. Be encouraged, your redemption draws near. And maybe I'm wrong about some of this last piece today, but this is my current working understanding um, and I think it maybe helps, it has helped me, I'll tell you what it's helped me to do, is I have become more careful with my personal health. And you might want to do that too, because if, if this was released, there might be other ones released too. They've already said that there will be more. So either they're just guessing, or they got their hand on a button somewhere, or, or yeah, I don't know. I don't know that. Can't read their mind. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power. These are the true remedies. So I, I recommend those to you. Jesus is coming soon. That's all. <laughs>